Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We're actually going to start. It's a little bit late, I realize. We're going to start. Welcome to the Rockefeller Institute of Government. Um, we're happy to be the public policy research arm of the SUNY system. Um, I'm Mike Hattery, and I'm the director of local government studies here at the Institute. Um, <coughs> we're really happy to have you here today uh, for a conference on local government that's meant to bring together both researchers, um, practitioners, and policy makers. Um, <clears throat> this is our second year at trying to reinvent an event like this. Um, on local governments in particular, um, it's, it's an effort to fulfill our mandate to foster the group local governance in the state. Um, We're hoping to do more of this sort of thing, um, whether it's an event or other kinds of local government activity. Um, we have some plans, but if you have ideas for other programs and activities that um, either we could help you with or that we might partner with, please catch me today. We'd love to talk about those things. Our goal today is hopefully an opportunity um, for you to be introduced to some current work that's going on both by researchers and by folks that are working in the trenches doing local government uh, work in communities in the state. And um, we've tried to make it so that there's a lot of time for you to talk both uh, with each other between sessions and with our speakers. We try to provide enough time for a lot of interaction with our speakers. So that's the goal. Please, uh, I hope you uh, if you have questions, you want to connect with somebody, please do that, because that's, that's what, what this event's designed for, um, to engage and meet one another and, and exchange ideas. Let me do a couple uh, housekeeping, no, it's not more than a couple, it's a lot of housekeeping list here. <laughs> we want to warn you, we are filming. Not that you have to worry about what your hair looks like now, huh? <laughs> Most of our speakers are the, uh, the uh, focus of uh, filming of the event, and it's available, it will be available online after the event. Um, we also take pictures during the event, just to let you know that. Um, on a little bit more mundane item, the restrooms are located downstairs, so if you came up the steps, if you go down the steps past the entry, and they're to your right at the, uh, the end of the first floor, in the front of the building here. Um, if you haven't done it already, please pull out your cell phone and silence them or put them on vibrate. Um, for each panel, we're going to give our speakers a. <laughs> we're going to give our speakers an opportunity, uh, and then we'll take questions after each panel is finished, um, not at the end of each presentation. Um, and during the Q&A session, in order to get things on tape, we'll have somebody with a mic. So please wait till they get to you with a mic um, when we have the Q&A time. Okay, let me, uh, you, you each should have a packet in front of you with a schedule. We're going to have a, a first session that I'm going to introduce here in a minute that will run from 10.50 to about 11.50. Then we're going to break for lunch till 12.40. And then we're going to have three consecutive panels with breaks in the afternoon. We should be finished by 4.30. So without going through each panel, that's a quick overview. Um, <coughs> one of the things that I'm very encouraged about is having some folks that are pro providing the kind of information and knowledge that comes from working directly with communities in New York State. And we have um, and our first panel has uh, three presenters that do that on a regular basis. Let me introduce them um, now, and then they'll, they'll give you their presentations and seat points. First of all, um, I think um, it, the group of presentation represents two really effective regional organizations in New York State that do a lot to help both communities and local governments in the regions they serve. Um, the first um, Two presenters are uh, Katie Malinowski from the Tug Hill Commission in Northern New York, uh, who's the executive director. And she's going to be joined by Angie Kimball, 
who is a local government advisor and circuit writer, um, which is circuit writing is, I think, more than New York is about the only place we have those in New York. Um, and they're going to be talking about their efforts in capacity building, planning, and justice courts. And then uh, Chelsea Robertson is with is the senior planner with the Southern Tier Regional Planning and Development Board. And uh, she's going to talk to us about local comprehensive planning and her work in Scott County. So, Katie, would you start us off? Good morning. Um, again, I'm Katie Malinowski, and it's not even like being the first person up uh, at, a present, at a conference like this. Warm, warm you all up and wake you up. Hopefully, you all had a good trip in. Um, we, we had about a two and a half hour drive, but it was clear sailing, and Chelsea had about the same. So, we're really happy to be here, and thank you, Mike, for um, putting us on the agenda. Uh, we are up there in northern New York, um, due east of Lake Ontario, and uh, between Lake Ontario and the Adirondacks. So, we love our little area of the world, but it is very rural, and um, I think we're working with rural communities is a great thing to do, but it also has its challenges. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the commission, and then um, Angie's going to get into some more details about some on-the-ground work we've been um, doing over the last few years. So, the origins of the Tug Hill Commission. Um, we started out as a temporary state commission back in uh, 1972 formed in response to concerns of local people at the time. Uh, there were other commissions going on in the early 70s, the Adirondack Commission and the Catskill Commission, all looking at these three large forested areas of New York State and, and what was going to happen with local governments and planning. They all went in different directions. We have the Adirondack Park Agency and we have the Catskill Watershed um, efforts in, in that area. And the Tug Hill Commission was a little different. We, we have a very grassroots um, focus. We have a board that are nine unpaid volunteers from the region. We um, are non-regulatory, so we can't make anyone do anything. We are really there to provide technical assistance to our local governments. And our mission is to enable local governments, private organizations, and individuals to shape the future of the Tug Hill region and to demonstrate and communicate ways that this can be done in other rural areas. So that's part of what, why we're here today is to try to share some of that um, lessons learned and to demonstrate and communicate how we've been doing it for about 43 years now. We currently have a staff of 13. Um, our home base is in Watertown with uh, program specialists and our circuit riders or local government advisors kind of use the term interchangeably. Um, live and work in the communities. They're very in touch with what is going on on the ground and that's kind of key to our program and its success. Our region is approximately 2,100 square miles and we are again the third largest forested area in the state. <coughs> we are a state agency. We're administratively tied to the Department of State and I see some of my um, colleagues here today so um, we're happy to see you. Uh, they are very supportive of our efforts and uh, it's great to see them here today. We have an operating philosophy, and it's pretty long, and I'm not going to read it all, all through, but it's really, again, about being in touch with what the local concerns are and taking our cue from the local people and then figuring out how to make things happen. Um, we, informed communities, we, we believe, make good decisions, and so we're all about bringing information to them. They, for the most part, in, the, in Tug Hill, and I think in a lot of rural communities, do not have any full-time staff. The boards themselves are part-time, they're all working full-time jobs, so it's really hard for them to sometimes keep on top of everything that's going on. As we all know, things are changing very rapidly, and it's even sometimes a challenge for professionals that are doing this all, all day, every day, to keep on top of it. So that's a very important role we play. Again, we don't have a plan. We're all about hearing from our communities and helping them put their own plans in place. Not regulatory. We don't interfere, and sometimes people want us to interfere. Some people, sometimes people say, well, wouldn't it be easier if you guys could come, just come in and tell us what to do? And well, no, that's not what it's about. We can't do it the easy way. We have to do it the hard way, but I think it actually ends up being much more successful in the long run. Um, we try to do some innovative things sometimes when the community is open to that, and you're gonna hear some innovative things that we've been doing um, recently. And again, we're just always trying to build local capacity. So yes, we are there, we have, 
staff that don't turn over a lot, so we can provide some institutional knowledge, if you will, to local boards that do tend to have um, quite a bit of turnover. Um, but we're all, always trying to build their capacity and their skills. We bring a lot of training to our local officials. We put together information packets, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so there's the region. So Watertown is here. Um, Syracuse is down here, Utica Rome over here. So we're bounded, here's Lake Ontario. We're one town in from the lake. There used to be a, another commission, the St. Lawrence Eastern Lake Ontario Commission. Um, the Black River kind of forms our boundary on the east. Um, we cross the blue line right here a little bit in the town of Forestport in Oneida County, and then come across Oneida, Oneida Lake. So it's portions of, of four counties, Jefferson, Lewis, Oneida and Oswego, and we have 60 towns and villages within our region. Um, that number keeps changing. We've had a couple of village dissolutions in the past few years, and we actually have another dissolution underway. So we've been seeing some of that happen in Tug Hill, as I'm sure some of you have in your areas. Our three main um, program areas, if you will, we don't really call them that because we're all pretty interchangeable. It's hard to just separate ourselves in silos, but we generally say we do land use planning, so we have planners on staff and we work a lot with planning boards, zoning boards, local laws, that sort of thing. And I've got some quotes in here that we, we do some surveys of our local leaders. We're always trying to keep in touch with them and hear what they have to say, so sometimes it's better to have it in their own words than in, in our words. So one of our, a COG is a council of government, and one of our leaders said, when, you know, when, when I think of the commission, I think of land use you know, planning and zoning. That's what their experience with us has been. We also have community development staff, and that's, you know, working on downtowns, working on infrastructure, trying to position communities to do improvements that they feel are important to their economic development. And again, um, it's always about trying to make the region and that individual town a better place for its residents to live. And then, of course, natural resources, that's what Tug Hill's all about, that's what defines us, is our, our water, our wetlands, our forests. Um, and so natural resources is a, is a big um, focus. And we get involved in very local natural resources issues. It might be um, this certain part of the stream, or it could be large regional issues like wind farms, like core forests, like you know, bigger issues that transcend local, um, and, and sometimes county boundaries are really regional issues that are, take a lot of effort to get your head around. And we do most of our program delivery through five councils of government. And we provide do that by providing training and technical assistance. So here's our map of our councils of government. Um, so the blue here's river area that is up near Fort Drum. Fort Drum is right here. So there's a lot of specific Fort Drum related impacts to that council of government. We have the Popper Tugwa Council, who's Angie um, serves, and they're more our, our core rural council of governments. Very low population a lot of forests and that kind of thing. We have Northern Oneida County Council of Governments, so that's, that's got more Utica Rome, the whole Marcy Nano um, development is affecting that Council of Government. We have two small ones over here in Oswego County, uh, Salmon Rivers and the North Shore of Oneida Lake Council of Government. And we have a few, the purple, that aren't affiliated with any council. They still do receive our services, but they don't get the services of a circuit rider at their town board meeting, at their planning board meeting. It's a little bit more removed for those communities. And I just have this graphic showing you the number of communities served. So um, 16 towns, Poplar Tuckville Council, that's a really big geographic area. Our largest is the Northern Oneida County with 18 communities, 12 towns, 6 villages, and it, it varies beyond that. So again, um, key to our um, service delivery is having circuit riders in the field, building relationships and trust with our, our towns and our villages. So they, they attend, and these are our four primary um, our on staff circuit riders, uh, loving to having to take a picture last week. Um, and we also have a few, um, the councils that hire a few contract um, uh, people to go and attend some of the meetings because there's just no physical way that Angie can be in six places at once, mm -hmm. although she really tries. Um, so we're attending, just with our circuit riders, over a thousand meetings a year. And that's a lot of travel and a lot of sitting and listening. But it's really important to be able to sit and listen to what's being discussed at a meeting so you really know what's going on. 
We um, provide extended planning assistance to communities on, upon request. Um, we, we are able to um, hear, the, hear their requests and a community might not really understand what they need and then talk to them after the meeting and say, well, maybe this is something you might want to consider and, and see what they want to do. But it's all about listening and then trying to connect the dots um, and to hear commonalities across communities and across councils of government. <laughs> And so they're the, our field staff, and then they they kind of determine. Well, I need to pull in somebody from Watertown on this issue, or you know, figure out how what's the best way to meet that need. And again, they're listening for the recurrent themes, um, process and procedure, just a lot of that technical, real detailed stuff. How do I do this? How do I do that? Um, and then the bigger projects. How do we find funding? How do we find somebody who might want to partner with us on a project? So I'm going to stop talking because Angie has a lot of good stuff to share with you, and I don't want to short-shift her, so Angie's up. Hello. As Katie said, my name is Angie Kizzle, and I represent the Department of Technical Council. Uh, the Department of Technical Council was formed originally in 1974 as the Department of Technical Planning Board. There were originally nine towns in four counties, um, focus was on comprehensive planning. It was uh, the Corporate of Chuck Hill Planning Board was formed uh, in response to a threat of extensive development that was um, being proposed on Chuck Hill by Horizon Corporation. In 1971, they proposed buying 55,000 acres of forest land in the middle of Chuck Hill for second home development. Um, the proposal luckily only lasted a year, but in the meantime, the Corporate of Chuck Hill Planning Board um, was formed. It, also, the, uh, the New York State Temporary State Commission for Tuck Hill was formed in 1972, and the towns were not overly thrilled with having the state come in. <laughs> <laughs> so the Department of Tuck Hill Planning Board uh, was formed by the towns themselves. Um, they, were, they were afraid that it was going to be another situation like the Adirondacks um, with state regulations being forced on them. So uh, as one of the people said at one of the early meetings, it's either zoned or be zoned. So they decided to zone on their own. <laughs> um, the, the goal of the Department of Chuck Planning Board was to produce a master plan, uh, a regional planning board that would keep Chuck Hill the way it was, um, while still developing services and economic improvements. Um, in 1978, two more towns joined the council, and then, uh, which brought the total to 11, and then in 1988, the uh, name was changed to the Cooperative Tug Hill Council, and the structure changed a little bit, and the focus shifted more to include technical assistance, training, community development, grant writing, in addition to the basic planning work. Uh, so in, in their early days, the uh, Tug Hill Cooperative Planning Board uh, started working on a uh, resource management plan. They recognized that the the shared resources of the area, the watersheds, the forests, and such were important, and uh, they were desired use by many. They, um, they decided that the common interests that they all had outweighed the possible difficulties that were going to be caused by having governmental divisions within nine towns and four counties. Um, so they felt that they were best able to decide what planning and regulation should be done in their area through the use of their home rule powers. And they thought that by banding together, that they could um, better make their weight felt to private interests and other levels of government. And they also felt that the cost of planning and implementation would be less if they worked together. So with these goals in mind, they started working on this Tug Hill Resource Management Plan. Um, the plan was a regional model develop, development code uh, from which many of the towns individualized their own town codes that were more specific to their towns, but still followed the overall regional goals. Um, so in 1976, the original plan was, was uh, approved by the nine towns that were in the cooperative at that point in time. And uh, it was updated in 2006, and on my plate for next year is hopefully <laughs> an update again. Um, so then in 1990, after the structure changed to the Department of Tuckville Council, there was a proposal by a governmental agency for a landfill in, in one of our towns in a, a town that happens to be very close to where the Chuck Hill Aquifer was. Um, so the council started working on a planning accord for Chuck Hill. And what they wanted this accord to do was alert governmental agencies who would not be covered by zoning that there was a comprehensive plan in the area and that <coughs> they wanted to preserve special areas that the local government 
documents were designated as special. Um, it was it was um, it would require that governmental agencies would have to consult with the local town boards. It didn't give the towns the right to to uh, stop their plans, but at least they would have to consult and be made aware of what the towns considered special areas that they might be infringing on. Um, through the work of the planning board for Tuck Hill, it led to the passage of the Tuck Hill Reserve Act by the state legislature, which was passed in 1992. <clears throat> the uh, Tuck Hill Reserve Act recognized the Tuck Hill region that it had statewide and national significance due to the water, the wildlife, the forests, and the farms and recreational resources. And it allowed for the protection of the special areas that the towns wanted through a local reserve plan done by a Chug Hill Council of Governments. So, as I said, the plan necessitates that the, if a governmental agency proposes an action in one of, a, one of <coughs> the Council of Governments towns um, that would change na the nature of the affected town or village or would affect one of their special areas that they had designated that they had to consult with the municipality regarding the consistency with the town plans. So the path documents now serve as the um, as the local plan, local reserve plan for the the Tuckahoe Council, my council of governments. Um, right now, we are in the process of updating our maps. Twelve of my sixteen towns have updated their maps. That's an example of a special areas map to the left there. Today. Um, our council. We had uh, since 1995 more towns have joined the Barbara Tuckahoe Council, which brings us to our total of 16 in four counties, as Katie mentioned. I'm in the middle, as she said. I'm in the middle of everything. <laughs> our total population in 16 towns is only 13,275 people. We range from Montague, which has a population of 78, <laughs> to uh, 1,800 in my biggest town, which is the town of Leiden. And we cover a lot of territory. And there are no roads that go through the middle of my territory. Mm -hmm. So you're taking the roundabout way if you have to get some of these towns. I live in Redfield, which is way down on the, on the edge. So sometimes it's quite a trip. Um, each town in, in our council of governments, uh, they appoint two representatives to the council. The council meets as a body, a whole body, at least twice a year to set goals and budgets to elect officers and to discuss major issues or joint projects that might come up. Some of the things that right now that they're looking at are the possible changes to the forest tax law, the 480A forest plans, which gives exemptions to prop, uh, forest property owners, um, something we've been working on for many years and have yet to get uh, through the legislature's minimum roads legislation, which um, the legislation that we proposed um, would amend highway law to allow towns to designate um, roads as minimal maintenance, low volume roads, and this not necessitate that having to be plowed in the winter. There are many, many miles of roads on Tug Hill that are snowmobile trails. They're not plowable. They're dirt. They're very narrow. Um, and as the, the way that things stand right now, that person requesting that the road be opened could have it opened, <laughs> and the towns would we have to come up with budget money in order to make the road plowable, which is very difficult in a lot of these small towns. Another thing that is, is going on currently is uh, wind farms. We have, I think, six proposed on Chuck Hill Road at this point in time. Um, and so that's the regional that has started. A lot of the, the of them are in Lewis County, but now they're starting to branch down into Oswego County. So um, my council governments, they operate through intermunicipal agreement, and they have an executive committee, which is like a board of directors that handles the day-to-day -day business. They are served by me, one full-time circuit rider, and we have two um, contract associates that help, because this case said you can't be everywhere at once. In fact, last week I had five meetings in one night, because people had rescheduled for budget purposes. Mm -hmm. And I said I need a loan. <laughs> Okay, um, here are some of the necessary services that we provide in the rural areas. There are a lot of areas where um, these communities, have, because they're so small, have been sharing services for years. I know that's the buzzword currently, sharing services, but most of my communities have decades of uh, practice at sharing services. One of the areas we do some um, sharing is the part of Tuckahoe Planning Board of Appeals. That's been nearly 40 years. That was one of the first things that the Cooperative Tuck Hill Planning Board did. 
currently there are five towns uh, on the Cooperative Tuck Hill Zoning Board of Appeals um, that uh, operates through IMA, again, intermunicipal agreement. The towns have a combined population of about 2,400. They hear under six cases a year. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to find people in each town to be able to hear that few cases. Um, so the, they, the uh, Cooperative Tuck Hill Council provides administrative support, which would be me, uh, to help them with setting up meetings and taking minutes and stuff like that, because once again, they just don't have the resources to do it themselves. Um, another area that a lot of our towns uh, work together already is in our emergency medical services. We have several ambulance scores that are shared between towns. We have ambulances that, um, that contract with multiple towns. We have shared fire protection districts where multiple towns operate under one fire department. Uh, one of them uh, covers 189 square miles, <laughs> one fire department. Um, and we also have, uh, we have other, um, I lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, have, we have another uh, ambulance corps in Lewis County that staffs ambulances in other parts of the county in, in order to cover during the day. So they, the fire company hosts the ambulance during the day so that, that there can be coverage. One of the largest parts of our budgets on top Tuck Hill because of the snow is in the highway departments. The highway departments for decades have been sharing highway labor because they usually have a very small workforce. They share uh, labor, they help with each other when they have to do road maintenance. They share trucking, um, they share purchasing, and, and in a couple cases they have bought equipment together. We have towns that have three or four towns that have bought a road room together or a tractor or a road mowers. Uh, so they're always looking for different ways that they can try to share uh, things together. A few of the other areas where we have some, some uh, combinations, we have town clerks who also are tax collectors. We have shared appointed assessors who do four or five towns. We have shared law patrol officers and services, shared panels. We have show, shared code enforcement officers, shared zoning officers. So. One of the biggest areas and one of the new areas that um, we've been working on, which I'm going to focus on a little bit, is justice courts. The, um, one of the problems with living in such a rural area is trying to find people to fill elected positions, especially elected positions that take a lot of training. Um, so we have already completed one court consolidation through Uniform Justice Court Act 106B. It was one of the first done in the state after the, the uh, amendment to the Uniform Justice Court Act. Uh, Harrisburg, Montague, and Pinckney, they operate with one justice working on one facility. We also have completed a residency requirement change um, for the town of Lewis. And I'll get into those in a little more depth in a minute. We have two uh, councils, or two towns, or three towns with two issues that are underway right now. The town of Brain and Worth, which are in Jefferson County and who are looking for some assistance in the town of Lesson, who is just as or just resigned. Um, we also have some towns and villages that share facilities. We have the town of Lydon and their village of Fort Lydon, and the town of Western and the village of Constableville, who um, share facilities and staff. And uh, there's, we have worked on an issue paper, but I'll get back to the end. Okay, the Harrisburg, Montague, Pinckney uh, court consolidation. These towns are located in Northwest Lewis County. They cover 146 square miles, and there's only 844 people. They have very small caseloads and have a very difficult time finding judicial candidates. The, uh, they shared a justice through temporary appointment from the 5th Judicial District from 2008 till 2011. The problem is it's a temporary appointment, so after a certain amount of time, the Judicial District starts to uh, say you need to do something to fix this. Uh, so in 2010, the Uniform Justice Court Act 106B um, was amended to allow towns to towns that adjoin each other to consolidate. So they follow the towns of Harrisburg, Miami, and Pinckney follow the Uniform Justice Court Act 106B procedure. Um, one of the requirements of that is after they pass a joint resolution to look at the situation is to have a study done. The study for the consolidation was done by the Tuck Hill Commission because once again funding becomes an issue sometimes and. Uh, so luckily they are in the Tuck Hill region. So the Tuck Hill Commission did the study for them. After the study was done, the towns all uh, approved to consolidate and um, pass another 
joint resolution which abolished their individual justice positions and called for the election of a single justice. This um, then went to the state legislature for approval and it was approved in 2011. They currently operate, like I said, with one justice. They use the facility in Harrisburg, which is the newest building and is the only one that is ADA compliant. They share staff and they share the building costs through an intermunicipal agreement. They just recently elected their justice again last week and uh, their intermunicipal agreement is due to be amended or looked at again next year. But that court seems to be working well. In the town of Lewis, <coughs> they're in southeast Lewis County, 65 square miles and a population of 854. They looked at doing a 106B consolidation, but the issue with the town of Lewis is the neighbor that they wanted to consolidate with is significantly smaller. It's only 229 people. So they were afraid that if they did a consolidation that the uh, neighboring town would never be able to have anyone from the town elected because there wouldn't be enough votes. So they looked for uh, some other type of solution. So after some meetings with uh, some folks from the commission and the people from the justice office, the judicial district office, um, we came up with the solution of doing so amendments to town law section 23 and public officers law section three. The, um, those two sections of law amend the residency requirement for somebody to run for the office of town justice in the town of Lewis. And the final legislation allowed for an individual for any neighboring, from any neighboring town in Lewis County to run for the election in the town of town justice. There are three towns in, that neighbor Lewis, um, which gives them a significantly larger pool of candidates to try and draw a justice from. The person that runs for the office would run just like they were a person from the town of Lewis. They would uh, petition or whatever to be on the ballot and only people from the town of Lewis would vote on it. So um, this was authorized by the state legislation in 2015. They currently share the justice with the town of Osceola, which is what they wanted to share with in any case. Um, and they, <laughs> it was so close to election time when the Legislation was finally signed that they had to elect the justice by write-in. So the town board, luckily, they had enough people write them in, and they <laughs> elected a justice, or that would have been vacant once again. Uh, here's some of our upcoming uh, work. As I mentioned earlier, Lorraine and Worth, which are in Jefferson County, um, have passed, the, they are starting a 106B process. They have passed the joint resolution to do the study. Um, one of the things you need, that we have to look at is, uh, do they have the capacity to do the study? Um, in our case, the commission does, will do the study for them. If not, they have to find funding for a consultant to do a study, which is not an option a lot of times in our towns. Um, sometimes there are some challenges of getting all the people involved to get on board with the idea of consolidating courts. Um, sometimes you have people that put the brakes on because they don't want to, to uh, don't want to only have one justice. Um, so. Uh, we are in the middle of that. We have not started the study yet in Lorraine, but that's the next on the agenda. And the other one, uh, the other town that we're working with is Boylston. Boylston is brand new. Their justice just resigned this summer, and they've had no luck so far finding another one. So there are the options that we're looking at with them. There are some options with a 106B consolidation. They have three towns that are joined them that are in the same county, Redfield, which has about the same population. Orwell, which is nearly twice the size of Boylston, and Sandy Creek, which is considerably bigger. Probably, Boylston has about 550 people. Sandy Creek has about 3,000. Um, and also has two villages, has a seasonal resort area. It's a completely different type of community. So um, if they decide to go with a 106B option, they have to, they have to decide who they might want to try that with. Um, if they go the residency route, uh, once again, it's a matter of how you write the legislation. Um, they adjoin Jefferson County. They are in Lewis or Oswego County. So in order to get the uh, legislation to read correctly, sometimes you have to do some work with your legislators in order to, to not hop county lines, which judges don't like to do. Um, other considerations are what is the caseload, what is the caseload of the court you want to combine with, how are you going to split up cost, what courtroom are you going to use, things of that nature. So there's a lot for Boylston to think about. They're just at the very beginning of the situation. And I'm going to 
send it back to Katie. To finish us off. This is our last slide, um, and, and it's just to kind of wrap up and show that how um, we've taken what we've learned at, in these towns, as Angie shared, and developed an issue paper. So. There's a, there's a big Justice Court manual that's about this thick that you can go and find, but that's a lot for someone to take in. So we put together an issue paper, you can find it on our website. It really kind of boils us down to things that um, are most relevant for towns. And we and that's been very popular. Um, we've had requests for that from other counties. Um, I don't know how many times it's been in on our website, but quite a few times. We also had a training session at our local government conference. We do an annual local government conference. We get about 700 people there. Um, Dave Gideon from the 5th Judicial District came last year and did a presentation about that because um, we're seeing this um, already in some of our adjoining councils. Um, the Northern Oneida County Council of Governments has three towns starting to, to go down this road. So I, it may be, I don't know if any of you are hearing about this where you're from, but it may be something that's starting in more rural areas and maybe something that gets bigger as time goes on. We've also shared this information, um, Lewis County, as um, an outgrowth of the work they were doing with their municipalities on, on, on tax freeze plans a few years ago. They all had to do these joint plans they put together. Um, a working group they've been meeting even since that was over to just kind of share information. We did a presentation to that um, group of people. So we're always, and this is a great venue to do that too. So we're just always trying to share and, and help people understand when you hear Angie talk, there's so many details and, and relationships and things that have to be put together that it, it makes it complicated and it takes some time to get that sort of thing done. So with that, that's our, our last, and we're going to wait for questions till the end, so I will stop now. Thank you. GIS and grant writing assistance. So, how are we funded? We're funded, most of our office is funded through Appalachian Regional Commission. We're at the very northern part of the Appalachian Regional Commission's uh, uh, region and Economic Development Administration. Um, then we have our three counties that also put in funding. And then when we get to the planning services, most of our, most of our um, activities are uh, funded through municipal contracts with municipalities who have contracted with us to do some of, cover some of their monthly meetings, kind of uh, similar to a circuit right program, and federal and state grants. We have uh, nine employees at this point, and it looks like we'll be adding uh, one to two more in the next year. Um, so the program I was gonna talk about uh, today is based in Schuyler County, one of our counties, our smallest county. So just a little overview of Schuyler County. Southern tip of uh, uh, Seneca Lake, eight towns, four villages, um, one county planner, very small budgets, um, little high speed internet. I had to put that in there because I hear about it every time I'm at a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're working on it. 
uh, aging population, um, mostly rural, very strong tourism industry with uh, the, the uh, wineries, breweries, uh, cheese trail now, um, which has just been booming in the last few years, um, and strong agricultural presence, which uh, we have between the, the tourism industry and the, and the agricultural presence, there's a lot of headbutting, believe it or not. So. <laughs> so where all of this started is, um, as a planner, I'm very interested in comprehensive planning. Uh, for better or worse, my region has not seemed to be hit with something big enough that has encouraged a lot of these municipalities to engage in comprehensive planning. Maybe hydrofracking got us part of the way there, um, but when that died down, it, uh, a lot of the municipalities kind of like, oh, we don't need a comprehensive plan anymore. Mm -hmm. um, Schuyler County uh, in 2012 um, undertook a countywide comprehensive plan. And they were frustrated that their municipalities uh, did not have comprehensive planning, many of them didn't have zoning. Um, and they, their idea was, we'll write this comprehensive plan, countywide, we'll create and collect the data that they need, all the municipalities need to write their own comprehensive plans. We'll engage everybody, we'll finish our comprehensive plan, they'll move forward and finish their own. And the goal was every municipality would have a comprehensive plan in the end. Um, so, 2014, it was completed. Each municipality was sent on their way to write their own comprehensive plan, and we got two. So many of them, just without the help of a consultant, because we the without with volunteer boards, it just wasn't happening. They need they needed more help. So around that time was when NYSERDA Cleaner Greener Phase Two round funding. Did, is, are folks familiar with NYSERDA Cleaner Greener Phase Two funding? So that was the first year that it was, and I guess we had it for two years for, the, for that, but that was the first year that it was released. Um, and they were funding comprehensive plans. So I said, let's pick up where the, the countywide conference plan left off. Um, Southern Tier Central will start working on this. Um, the award amount, we, we were successful. Award amount was uh, around total, the total project was about $300,000. Three year grant, um, all of the, uh, the match was made through $10,000 from my office, uh, Southern Tier Central, and the rest was all in-kind donation from our wonderful uh, uh, county planner, a, a, a Schuyler County Planning Department, um, and she has been kept very busy. Um, we definitely did this before she was hired, so she kind of walked in on it, <laughs> but she, she has helped us quite a bit. So, This is just an overview of what we have accomplished. We're right at the end of the three years. We haven't quite finished everything up, but comprehensive plans. We had the town of Reading, um, the village of Montreal Falls. We also had the countywide plan had to be amended to incorporate some of those cleaner, greener uh, uh, principles that uh, NYSERDA wanted to incorporate. So we actually uh, uh, amended their newly adopted countywide comprehensive plan as well. Um, Zoning law updates we also wrote for, so we have written uh, Town of Dix, Town of Catherine, just adopted theirs finally last night. Village of Montreux Falls, Village of Odessa, and Town of Reading all have some of them for the first time zoning. Most of them have not had updated zoning in about um, 20 years, 30 years. So uh, it, it was just huge for a lot of these municipalities to get them zoning, and we're, we're very excited about that. So, NYSERDA, of course, wanted a lot of community engagement. We wanted community engagement. Um, as a comprehensive plan, this is part of it, right? Get everybody to the table. And what works? Food works, right? <laughs> so not that I didn't know this, but it really works if you advertise it. I just assumed we'll have some, you know, we, we've always had some food out at the table. But I started putting it on posters. And people showed up in droves for those Wegman sandwiches. I mean, <laughs> uh, so funny thing in Schuyler County, so the closest Wegmans is in Corning, so it's about a 30 minute drive. And people drive that and they really like Wegmans. So if you bring a Wegman sandwich to them, they get very excited. Um, uh, flexible timing. So generally when we were doing, when we were doing uh, community engagement, we would do formal presentations such as this. Everybody sit around, ask questions, write down information. And, you know, we got the same faces, the same people that were always willing to come to these meetings continue to come to these meetings. So how do we engage everyone else? Um, and so we tried doing a, 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 an open house. And we tried to say, we'll give them two hours. You can drop by any time. And 
and we'll feed them. And we'll give them five dollar Dunkin' Donuts gift cards. Also, people show up in droves for those. Um, <laughs> it wasn't very expensive. And I started was willing to pay for all this, which was great. Um, and we'll do you know mixture of activities and presentations. And so for the for the for the rather we traded out that traditional meeting for this open house, and it was great. We had three planners, three staff members. Um, as people walked in, sometimes it was an interview, one on one. If they walked in alone, if they walked in with a group, we'd sit down at a table with a group. We walked through some questions. We expected folks to stick around for 10 to 15 minutes. No one stayed for under an hour. It was, I mean, everybody stayed for over an hour. It became a social event. People enjoyed it. It was, it was a good time, actually. So we were very happy with that. Since then, all of our conference employees have been doing that. So, um, so I'm jumping ahead here. So. The traditional conference of plan, and I know a lot of planners are already doing a lot of these things, but the traditional conference of plan is this very land use, uh, informs like our land use, our zoning law, right? So it's very much uh, what are the desired industries and what are the desired housing types and, and what what are we discouraging and where are we discouraging and where, where are we wanting to develop? Um, and, and my region, you know, we're rural, we have a lot of open land, so we have a lot of places and we don't have a ton of development pressures. Um, well, that's growing, particularly with the tourism in Scatter County. So, uh, NYSERDA said, we want you to incorporate our cleaner, greener principles. Why? Wow, easy. Some of those are really hard to incorporate into rural communities, and we're, we're working in communities that don't have sidewalks, talking about, you know, walkability, you know, we, it's a little strange. It's a strange conversation to have. Um, but they were very flexible with us. I was actually really pleased. I said, look, you know, do what you can. Our goal in this process is not necessarily that everything we want makes it into the plan. Our goal in this process is that um, is that you've talked about it. You've educated the residents. You've had public input sessions. You've brought folks to the table to talk about the plan and greater principles, which was easy enough to do. So some of the ways that we did this is um, this is just a page from one of our plans over here. Uh, we talked about location affordability index, um, personal auto usage, walk scores. Solar energy capacity, things like that, that we could that we could do um, in some of the rural towns, um, and talking about what it means to live in a rural area, what it means to live in a village, um, why we might be encouraging some of this denser development into hamlets or, or villages, um, and those conversations went very well. And where we could incorporate things from cleaner greener, we did into the plan, um, and where we couldn't, we at least had the conversation and educated the folks at the table. So. The second part, and this wasn't a nice sort of piece, but um, was what we had, so, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> you want to record everybody. Okay. okay. So uh, the second part was these good governance survey questions. So this is something that myself and a couple of the planners in the office started doing is when you go to these conference of plan meetings, you have your first public meeting, right? You get everybody at the table, and you're talking about land use. And everybody, you say, what's the biggest problem? And everybody raises their hands and says, taxes. Mm -hmm. OK, so, and then they say, yeah, we have too many services, and our government doesn't communicate with us, and why aren't they sending us out newsletters weekly? And you know, they have a whole range of things that we don't usually put into a comprehensive plan. <laughs> but we talk a lot about it. And it's hard to avoid those conversations. Well, it occurred to us, maybe we should just start talking about it. Um, so we started talking about taxes and services received, satisfaction with services. So here's an example of a survey question that we've been using in all of our comprehensive plan surveys. Is we started, as, particularly in the villages that provide a lot of services. So this is a village of Montour Falls. Um, they provide sidewalk snow removal village-wide. It's amazing for a small little village. Um, their taxes are high, as you would imagine. Uh, but we wanted to hear from the residents, as long as we're engaging the residents in all these other questions, why not hear from them about how they feel about their services? Mm -hmm. So we have this list of services that are provided. Do you want the services to go away? Are you happy with it as it is? Um, would you like more, but you're not willing to pay more? And would you like more and you are willing to pay more? Um, and then we have potential future services. Now we say future services, some of these are services that they had and they stopped doing. So leaf and brush pickup. So a lot of folks on this question are just saying, yeah, we used to get that. Now we don't. Our taxes never changed and we're frustrated, but we're not willing to pay more for it. So 
We got that information. Mm -hmm. uh, village website's a big one. A lot of our municipalities are just getting their first website, um, are frustrated with it. And I don't think they're that expensive, but <laughs> anyway, so village websites, recycling, garbage removal. Um, we found that this was a great way to talk about those things that are going to be talked about regardless of uh, in, at any public meeting. Um, it was a perfect opportunity to engage the residents. It gave survey questions and data directly to the village trustees or the town board to make decisions on. Um, and it's a lot easier to engage residents in these discussions outside of the village board and the trustees meeting and outside of the budget discussions. Because that's when it's happening. They get those questions every day. But we were doing it as this is, you know, we always present a comprehensive plan in our first meeting as this is a feel good time. This is a, you know, in a perfect world where money's not an issue, what would we want and what could we have? And this is a really good time to have those discussions. So um, we found that it doesn't get contentious. It's actually a pretty good discussion. And then we work it into the plan. Um, we have, after collecting this, then created for some municipalities, if they wanted, a full chapter within their conference plan just on the local government, um, the services provided, the cost of those services, the goals, the challenges, and recommendations for how they can move forward. So the outcome of Compre oh, the Schuyler County uh, program has been a countywide um, comprehensive plan update. The two the two comprehensive plans for the village and the town, Montreux Falls and Reading, the five zoning law rewrites, which uh, three of them are in their final stages. Um, we've also created for all the municipalities we weren't able to help, so we worked with a total of five municipalities out of the twelve. Uh, we created a guide to environmental planning, which really just kind of set out all of the goals. How can we help them? That combined with the, uh, the census data and other information, we hope that they can move forward uh, with their comprehensive plan and uh, zoning goals. And uh, lots of countywide training, which was a requirement of the grant, but we really enjoyed doing that anyway, um, in municipal training sessions to understand all of these land use issues better. <coughs> So we have a roving mic. Any questions? Yeah. Um, one of the things that it seems like each of you do do and need to do is figure out how to be responsive to local needs. So I'm, wa I'm wondering if you could talk about how you view your own capacity uh, given you, know, you have a certain number of staff and all of you have your own areas of expertise and so on, and how you kind of work between what you know you have the ability to do and what people want you to do. It is, yeah. it's definitely always a challenge. I mean, as the commission, um, when I first started the commission, we had 18 staff, state budget issues, and you know we have 13 staff people on the books right now. So we do have to be careful not to overpromise and to make sure that we have the expertise <coughs> that we need to meet what's going on in the communities. I think we've gotten a little bit more efficient um, with tech using technology. You know, that's you got to try to make it e more easily accessible. We, we've really cut down on the time we take to do mailings. We were just trying to find ways we can work smarter. I mean, uh, and it's probably a personal um, weakness of mine. I have a hard time saying no. Um, I never want to say, I'm sorry, we just can't do that for you. So we, we've always just working hard to make sure we figure out a way to do it and, and cross training so we don't have staff that only know how to do one thing. We all kind of try different things and, and we lean on each other quite a bit. It's certainly a challenge for us as well. Um, and what we've been doing recently is I, I had to at one point come up with a set of what can we provide to everybody and what we can we not and what are our rules. And so 
one of the rules we came up with is, so we have 66 municipalities and really right now two planners that cover them. Um, and then we have these municipal contracts. So at what point do we cross over from what does our ARC and EDA funding fund us to do and what do we need them to pay us for a municipal contract to do? Um, and so we kind of came up with a, a threshold that, you know, at some point this is becoming bigger than what we can do uh, just with our own staff and we need a municipal contract. And then there's also the, kind of this rule of have I helped you already a lot? <laughs> and do I have another municipality over there that is, ask, is asking for help for the first time? Um, we definitely try to give them priority. Um, and we have, a, we have a little bit of a tally <laughs> going. Um, that being said, in, in the end, uh, usually if we can't provide it, if it becomes bigger than something that we can do, which recently we have a couple of those issues, we have worked with our, some of our local planning consultants to see how we can make them more affordable to um, to the municipality, and often that means we say we'll pick up X amount of work if you can do this piece. So um, there's only a handful of planning consultants in the region to choose from, and sometimes it's a struggle even to find one of them available willing to drive out to our region and work. But uh, that's actually been real successful recently, um, is working with them and us doing a doing a portion of the work to alleviate some of their Anybody else? Pass this back here so I don't have to do it anyway. This is fine. I'm sorry to be in the back. <laughs> so, could you tell me something about how community engagement is continued and promoted? perhaps through the plans you help the municipalities create. Again, if this is such a valuable part of it, and how do we, you know, you've got the folks that are often doing the planning, doing the decision making, going to the town board meetings, but they get disconnected or the communities don't feel they're being responsive to them. How do we continue to engage both and form the community, and, and do you build it into, into plans? So for the town accounting plan, which was one that really prompted we need to start talking more about what's happening in, in the local government as part of the um, conference of plan, uh, we did build it into the plan, and we have in the past. By building it into the plan, we make these strong recommendations of, look, the, the, the town board needs to set out that we are going to have some public meetings that aren't in our normal town board meeting on a Tuesday night at 7 p.m., with the rest of our agenda. We're going to have an open session to discuss issues that have been brought up throughout the year. Let's do this twice a year. Um, a lot of discussions about newsletters. There's a, there, there was a strong presence of municipalities sending out newsletters often, years ago, and that's all gone away. And residents are saying that that was the only way that they were getting information. And I will say in our region that we don't have very much press coverage, and we have a really hard time getting press to cover things, and I even took them off. <laughs> it's going to be a good meeting tonight, you should be there, and they don't show up. But um, these are, you know, it, it's, it's very frustrating. So we've actually, you know, we're trying to encourage this, the websites, some newsletters that said, you don't have to mail them, we understand that's costly, but you should do something. And these newsletters can be picked up at the local town hall. This is a way to communicate with your residents. But it's, it's a constant struggle. I mean, many of the residents feel disconnected from their local government. And on the same note, the, the town and villages boards are having a really hard time finding how do they do this without spending a lot of money. And you know, they say, well, we, pub we do what's required. We publish the meeting in the, our normal meeting in the, in the press, in, in, the, in the newspaper. and. You know, if folks want to hear, they should show up. So we're trying to get them out of that and look at other options. Um, but it, it's it's a constant struggle, and we have been building in recommendations into the conference plan for that. Hi, um, over here. Hi. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm from the University at Albany, and so my question dovetails the one that was just asked about community engagement. There's been um, research around the area of the different ways to engage people, and I think you're talking a little bit about that. And also, but closing the loop. So when you hear from people, there's been a lot of criticism of, 
um, not taking what people have said and then presenting it back to them and giving them information that says either we we've, we've chosen to go down the path that you have identified or we have chosen not to go down the path. So in, in the area of research of community engagement, those are the two areas that are really a, a struggle for government. So I think you've talked a little bit about trying to create different environments by which to get the information. But do you, uh, how do you plan and think about how you present back the information to the people and, and tell them whether you have decided or not to, to use some of that? Well, some of this falls on the municipal boards to do what we have asked them to do. <laughs> but one way that, uh, one way, you know, you always get those comments where people really feel like they may be in the majority, and then you see the data to say that they're absolutely not, and they're usually the really angry person <laughs> at the meeting. And you do have to respond to them, but what we've been trying to do is make sure that we publish all of the, all of the um, information received. Um, Unfortunately, the way that we get that out to folks is they can request it at the town hall or it's on the internet. And so they have to, they have to go on the internet, which is a challenge in our region um, to get. Uh, but that's what we've been trying to do. Um, I would like to see them, the municipalities do more in the way of having these public meetings, doing something we've talked about, having uh, potlucks or events or something on some sort of regular basis, even if that's once or twice a year, to report back. Um, but those are, those are recommendations in the conference of plan. Um, municipalities, I wouldn't say, have run away with those recommendations and implemented them, but we're hopeful. I'll just add that you're right, the internet is an issue. I mean, they want to cut costs by not doing mailings back out, and so they try to use a website, and we have internet issues, access to broadband, that kind of thing. So it's hard and you know municipalities towns and villages are really struggling just to do their day-to-day -day business not that community engagement isn't important it's obviously but it really is and maybe we need to you know think outside the box on ways we can all engage in a little bit more but it's a good point hey i was uh over here no <laughs> um, i was just curious about your interactions with the regional economic development councils if you had any in the planning process or had that one um, well, Tug Hill um, is a little different. We're split into three different regional economic development councils. So two counties go to North Country, one county goes to Central New York, and one goes to Mohawk Valley. So that's been just a logistical um, a thing to come over, to get over. Um, I've spent time, in, and my predecessor has spent more time with North Country. It's two of our counties. And um, it, it doesn't have a, a, a large um, city dominating the council. It's a little bit more diverse in a smaller population area. So we've been pretty engaged with, with sitting on some of the subcommittees with that council. For Mohawk Valley and for Central New York, we've had two, our two circuit riders that live in those counties attending the meetings and trying to stay on top of things at least a little bit. Um, but I will say for our communities, it's, with the new regional council process, it's been a little bit more difficult for them to access some of the grant programs. It seems like this the whole the focus on job creation has been the difficult thing for them to show in a lot of their applications. When you're talking about a park or you're talking about, you know, a sewer or a water project, it just really needs to happen because there's an issue. It's not necessarily easy to tie it to something that's creating jobs or, you know, maybe retaining is a little easier, but it's I would just say it's been a challenge for our, our communities. We're really lucky in our region. We're all in one council, the uh, Southern Tier uh, Regional Economic Development Council, and many of my board members actually sit on the board of, uh, uh, of the council, sit on the council. And we find, I, I mean, I, I've been on work groups, all of our staff members are on a work group or two, um, but we are not super engaged in the process. Um, and I think there has to be some separation because we're submitting a ton of applications to them as well. So it's been a little odd. I do find that we submit these applications. I find out what was submitted for the region and I spend a lot of my time as well as other staff times lobbying the folks we know that are on the council, um, telling them about our application. Um, but that, that's, about, that's about it. Hi, um, this is 
Robertson, you talked about the, the how you, not NYSERDA was your major funder. Um, and you talked about how you needed to be attentive to the cleaner, greener features they wanted to incorporate in your plan. And since they provide call the tune, they pay the money and they call the tune. Uh, and you talked about how some of those were kind of oddly you know, suited to a rural planning. One of them was solar energy, which I, I was that a, a two-part question. Was that a capacity measure for solar energy, or, or was yes. it okay? There, was there? I don't. How did you? How did that pan out? And was there any justification offered as to why a regional plan should take account of solar energy capacity as opposed to capacity for any other kind of renewable energy source or other energy source? Well, we did. We did all. It, solar was just one of the examples on that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was the example you gave. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Right. But there, okay. they went, we went through all the capacity. There was a couple. Um, and I started pointing us in the direction of a couple different calculators that we use that right. did solar and wind, and we, we went through all. So, and we talked about those within the conference plan. Um, and those actually, the renewable energy. I mean, those are very suited to our rural areas, and we're seeing um, quite a bit of solar right now. Solar projects we've had wind. What about supply or transmission capacity, which are that's more immediate priorities? <laughs> that's the challenge. <laughs> that's the that's challenge, challenge that's mentioned in the conference yes. plan. Okay. Yes, um, which is, yeah, I don't have any great answers for you, but um, that's the challenge that's mentioned in the conference plan, and, and that's what we identify is, you know, um, I sort of said, these are what you, we want you to consider. We say, okay, we've considered them, and these are our challenges that we need to find a way to overcome, and these are the possible answers we may have, which um, is, it, is it possible that my serve being in the promote, promote renewable energy business was seeking to have you join them and promote renewable energy without looking at other energy issues? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will not put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> So every municipality has been different um, because it depends on first off the grant. So we've done a, this. This uh, what I presented on was just for Schuyler County, but we've done a couple of these projects um, elsewhere as well, and it depends on what was in the budget and what the municipality agreed to. The best situation is submit the, or every property owner gets a gets a survey with self uh, with a self address stamp envelope to return it. That gives us the highest uh, back. Uh, I'm not our guys know the term right there we go. Um, and then what we've done for tourists in one community, you know, so it's it's hard because it the communities to convince them that the tour we need to hear back from the tourists is something that I'm always pushing, but it's not something that's always uh, is always uh, accepted by the board I'm working with. Um, in one community, we sat at some local events in Schuyler County, because in the summer, Schuyler County is booming. They have an event every weekend, they have the wineries, they have, people are there, it's easy to grab those tourists, and we did a separate survey for the tourists asking information from them, um, and had a separate data points for them. Um, but I was only able to convince one community to do that, out of the two that we did for Schuyler County. Um, <coughs> Lake, the project I worked on in Cuca Lake, which was a, a we, we've done a lot of that, actually, is working with the, the tourists to figure out what their interests are um, through conference planning. So what if they had more than, they could have had multiple people at one residence, so it was still yeah. just one survey? Uh, so we, we, we make it an online survey, we give them one survey, we mail them one survey, and we tell them to feel free to photocopy it or pick up at um, the village or the village or town hall as well, multiple copies. And we actually place, and then for the renters, because sometimes I'm not sure if it's getting to them or not, we've posted, we've done big stacks at their uh, rental offices and asking them to disseminate them. Um, one of the big concerns, particularly if there's a contentious issue, um, in the town of Reading, this was huge, was uh, they have the uh, uh, controversial issue of uh, natural gas storage under the lake in the salt caverns, and they were just sure that people were gonna come out of the woodwork and take 50 surveys or 60 surveys a piece and turn them in. And we didn't know what to expect. We thought maybe they will. We don't know. And we had a very um, 
a great intern <laughs> and a, a, a very uh, technical uh, numbering system and evaluation system for the online ones where we were tracking how many were coming from each IP address. And we found that there, nobody, nobody, that didn't happen. So that was really, but we haven't done that for every municipality. We've only done that when there's been a concern. And so far, it's, we, the results don't seem skewed at all. We haven't had those issues. You both mentioned, um, in the context of some great examples of intermunicipal cooperation, and, uh, the role of local elected officials. And sometimes the local elected officials uh, can be more of an um, obstacle than a facilitating factor. And I invite you to comment on what you have done to kind of bring local elected officials uh, along, inform them, and uh, in particular get them to play more of the role of catalyst. Uh, uh, across boundaries. I think one of the advantages that we have is the circuit writer program. We have people in their meetings every month. Uh, so we know who might, might possibly be having an issue with whatever. So that, uh, it's a lot easier for us to, to connect them maybe with another official that might have had a similar thought process and, and sometimes hearing it from somebody who's not, somebody who's in local government as well will help get them on board where they need to go. So that's a big advantage for us. I will say that while we have had a handful of issues, for the most part our region has worked really well together. Um, they're really committed to working together. Uh, you know, I find that where we do have the issues, it's uh, a town arguing with their village. Um, and <laughs> two, in two of those cases, it's been out of uh, after a unsuccessful dissolution vote, it really um, it it really harms the community for years. I mean, it's been three or four years since the last one, and it's it's we we can't get the town and the village to talk at all. And I'm doing a conference plan for the village right now, which is really frustrating. So, you know, um, all we all we can do is continue to invite them, or all we've been doing is continuing to invite them to the table, asking the village to consider what they have to say, um, you know, seeing what they have to say, because often it's not that different than what the village officials have to say, and sometimes that starts to build that bridge again. So. I'm going to bug in. Um, I have two quick questions. As you think about this for a minute, what do you think the average amount of person time is on the part of a circuit writer or other staff that are helping to pull off a court consolidation? Think about, that. Think about that for a minute. Chelsea, I wanted to know, you mentioned uh, in your survey indicated that you actually gave people the option to say that they actually would like more services and would pay more. Where is there anything where that was a majority of residents that indicated that they would they would like more and would pay more, and how did local officials respond? Well, I actually we don't just, hear about that very often. Well, well, I know. So I wanted to put it on a survey, and the first time I did it, I was a little nervous to see what was going to come out of it. And um, actually, everywhere we put it on a survey, which is usually a village, because we've done it in the towns, but a lot of the towns aren't providing enough that it's a very valuable question. Mm -hmm. But in the villages, every village, it's been a majority on a couple different items. And what's mm -hmm. funny is, it's never on like the police service, because they're always arguing over you know, police coverage and what the cost is. It's never on um, you know, the, the paid fire department or something like that. But it's always on leaf and brush pickup <laughs> and snow removal and roads. Those are, I mean, all the DPW services, um, those, those are the big ones. And it's, all, it's, it's a little shocking to me. Um, that it, and we've had a majority leaf and brush pickup. Uh, one, the, one of the communities I'm working in right now is the Village of Painted Post. Um, that's 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 what they that's what they want. They want more of, and they're willing to pay more for it. And what are the local officials' response? Um, they balk a little bit. <laughs> we're, we're, it's still yet to be seen. Um, I I do think that it they they've all said well we certainly won't cut that service because it was something that they were considering cutting. Because when the local officials look at it, they they're looking at it well. We're not going to touch the police. We're not going to touch the fire. But let's talk about these smaller services. And then when they see those surveys, they think, well, okay, they're willing to pay more for it. At least let's keep them at where they where they where they are. I don't think they'll increase the service. <laughs> so Angie, got that estimate? Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if I could estimate because the depending on the way that the consolidation is done is so different. 
the, the 106 B consolidation is a lot more work than the residency one, but even with the residency one, it was many hours of um, meetings, setting meetings with the town boards that were involved, setting up meetings with the justice court system, and then a lot of work on the part of the commission to, to get the legislation done, that, and then you have to set up meetings with your state legislature, and then when we finally did get it approved by the legislature, we waited two months for the governor to sign it. So <laughs> it's a long, a long process, and that's the easier way. The court consolidation through 106B is significantly longer. Um, Usually take you at least a year. The residency requirement took us about seven months. The consolidation, I believe, was over a year. And a tenth of a tenth of a FTE of your time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I have too much, too much, we'll, we'll too many things going on at once. Well, we'll work, work on that estimate and post it on the website. <laughs> I think we're ready for lunch now. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this panel. We appreciate it.